If you don't want to spray, the most important thing you do is plant black varieties. The black ones just do not rot even a third as much as the bronze do. All the bronze are fairly bad about rotting. The black are usually really good about not rotting. I found the red ones like Ruby Crispy somewhere in between. Not quite as bad as the bronze, a little bit worse than the black one. But if you want to do organic or home garden, that type of thing, concentrate to the black varieties if you don't care which color you have. Dean Family Acre. Another stop at another Bucky's. Never been to this one before, so we're in Perry, Georgia, on our way to Tifton to enjoy this Muscadine meetup. So, hopefully, you guys are enjoying the trip. Are you following? We're going yeah, to What's your name? Mine. Do a you're walk through and then you're free to walk through and do whatever. You moved up in seven yeah, yeah. We're going to start the bronze cultivars, then we'll go through the black ones, then we'll go through the selection. This is the grape that started it all. This is Scuppernong, the original vine. Uh, it was on the eastern North Carolina, towards the top of North Carolina. It's big for a wild muscadine, but the primary reason this was the original cultivar that lasted 200 plus years and sparked the industry is because it is a natural mutation that is bronze in color instead of black. Everything else in the wild is pretty much black. And the reason they liked it was because if you make wine from the black ones, you get a lot of sediment and it gets dirty looking. The, the, the bronze ones make a cleaner wine. And so that's why they originally went to it more preferentially. Plus it has a fairly good, for a wild muscadine, fairly good flavor larger than most of the wilds and so that's what our industry was built off of pretty much until the early 1900s when they started breeding. Uh, we went back and we did our pedigree analysis of every muscadine that's been bred and released and we traced them all the way back so muscadines are an interesting crop and in that we can go clear back to the very first frounders in our breeding program and they have records of the wild ones that were used, where those wild ones were collected, why they were collected, what traits they had. Almost no other crop do we have that early history. So if you went back into wine grapes, we really don't know what, what was selected where to make your famous wines. What we found in Muscadine was all the variation you're going to see today can really be traced back to about 10 wild founders. And so it shows you, you know, what you could do with just a few individuals. And when we trace the pedigrees back, Scuppernong is by far the most important one in our pedigrees. And on average, 25% of the genetic makeup of any cultivar released today is Scuppernong. So that's a, that's a really big contribution from a single vine. One of the things we're doing in the breeding program is, when we looked at all those wild ones, they pretty much all came from eastern North Carolina and a, little, a couple on um, eastern South Carolina at the top. So it's a really small band of where that genetic variability came from that makes up our modern muscadine. We're getting some wild muscadines. We have one from the coastal New Jersey, uh, one from Tennessee, one from Kentucky, one from Louisiana, Florida. So we're trying to bring in some wild ones, cross them to our current cultivars, and see what kind of variation we can get. I'm especially interested in, uh, and I want to get from some from University of Arkansas, from Arkansas, um, Oklahoma, Eastern Texas. I'd like to get some more variation from that region because that's almost not been used at all in terms of breeding to, to get more um, variability in our germplasm and see what other traits we can come up with uh, in the breeding program. The reason we went away from Scuppernong is the yield is not that great on Scuppernong. Modern cultivars will have two or three times the yield of a traditional Scuppernong vine. Uh, we've mostly gone in, in nature, you have male and female vines. Early breeding, they develop self-fertile cultivars, which is just a cultivar that has a perfect flower. 
That is a mutation of a male vine to produce pistils again and then become um, able to make fruit itself. Uh, one of the differences between male vines and female vines is a male vine has a bigger cluster than does a female vine. So when they made the male vines back into a perfect flower cultivar, that's why perfect flower, perfect clusters are bigger on average than our female clusters. That's one of the reasons perfect vines are more productive than a female vine. The other reason is because you get better pollination, of course, because it's a perfect flower, so you tend to set more berries. One of the issues, and you'll see it in the new selections we're having with the self-fertile vines, is they're getting overproductive. Our first self-fertile vines are like Noble Carlo size. You're looking at seven, eight gram berry. You can have bigger clusters, more berries. The plant can sustain that. Then we went up to things like um, Hall and Terra, nine, 10 gram berries. Again, more berries than a female. That's about what the vine could do. Our new cultivars like Ruby Crisp and Pawk, we're looking at about a 15 gram berry. So that's another third bigger we're still setting about the same number of berries and it's getting to be more than the vine can handle. If you do not crop load control cultivars like that, they tend to want to fruit themselves to death. They'll produce a lot of fruit one year and it'll be okay in quality, but you don't go into the um, winter with enough reserves in the roots uh, because you've just bled the plant dry trying to ripen that fruit. You're more likely to get winter injury that that winter, that's the biggest thing for winter injury, is overcropping the vines the year before. The next year, you don't have reserves in the roots and it sends out a little shoot, but it'll still set the same number of flowers on that little shoot. And so it'll send out a shoot about that long, it'll set similar number of berries, and you just don't have enough leaves to feed it. And then that really drains the plant. And you can get the cordons dying back and, and not leafing out well in the next spring. Once they've gone into that cycle, I've defruited and it takes two to three years of taking all the fruit off to get that vine back to where it should have been in terms of balance. So if you can avoid getting them to do that but to start with, you're much better off. Usually once the vine gets mature, gets you know five, six years old, then it seems to be much more able to sustain itself and set the right crop load. It's those young vines, the first two or three years where it doesn't have enough roots, but it's still filled out the cordon and wants to set a full-size crop, it just doesn't have the root capacity to feed that crop. So that's just something to think about as you get these new cultivars, which have big berries and perfect flowers. Uh, let's look at the next one down. is Higgins, which is an old cultivar. This was University of Florida release. It was the first, what was considered a very big berry for its day, which I think was like in the 50s and 60s. And so this is kind of what the fresh market was built on, was starting at this size berry and getting bigger. Prior to the 70s, there was, the commercial industry was either juice and wine or secondary products like jelly. There was not much of a fresh market industry. It was hard to store them. Groceries didn't have real good refrigerated storage. The berry size was not quite good enough for that. It wasn't until the release of Fry in 1970 that we really got the fresh market industry going. This is Hall. This is one of our releases for the early market bronze. This one, Hall season is about over. We released it, number one, because it picks well. It was big enough, it's not super big, but it's big enough for our market. Um, we wanted something similar to Terra, which is next door to it, but with better flavor. We had growers like Terra, but they didn't like the flavor of it. Uh, Terra, sometimes it tastes great, sometimes it gets an off flavor to it. We haven't seen that problem in Hall. The biggest problem we have in South Georgia Hall is keeping the berries clean. Uh, we do spray fungicides. I don't recommend you plant most bronzes on a commercial level if you're not gonna spray fungicide. You're too often you're gonna get rock. Now this is a berry that was passed due. Um, but when you see that, you see the brown on it, and it's got kind of a salmon colored spores. That's ripe rock. 
very common in most of the bronze, including hall. Most important thing you can do for bronze varieties is get them picked as soon as they're ready. They do not hold well on the vine if we're getting weather like we've had the last two years with frequent rainfall. Uh, one of the other things I try to have growers do if they're going to have a fair number of vines, if you're going to have early, mid, and late, try to plant the late ones separate from the early ones because you have that two week post harvest interval that you can spray and then you have to wait two weeks before you can harvest them. If you have the early and the late mixed together, your late, can, you might end up having to shut off your sprays at the same time as the early, but you might pick them three to four weeks later. So if you separate them out, you can spray an extra spray on the late ones and cover those berries a little bit longer to try and avoid some of this rot. If you don't want to spray, the most important thing you do is plant black variety. The black ones just do not rot even a third as much as the bronze do. All the bronze are fairly bad about rotting. The black are usually really good about not rotting. I found the red ones like Ruby Crispy somewhere in between. Not quite as bad as the bronze, a little bit worse than the black ones. But if you want to do organic or home garden, that type of thing, concentrate to the black varieties if you don't care which color you have. I kind of like the flavor a little bit better than fry. Mm -hmm. It did not replace fry, I think mostly because it's dark. Grocery stores sometimes when they see something this dark, they think it's overripe and not good and they reject them. They'd much rather see green in color. <laughs> that too. <laughs> this is fry and it's a very, um... you can see the difference in color and size between the summit and the fry. Fry's just a little bit lighter color. Um, this vine has never done well. I don't understand. It looks to me like it. Normally when I would see this, this is almost always 2,4-D damage or dicamba or something like it. Uh, but I'm only seeing it on this vine and not the others, uh, which makes me wonder if it's got a virus or something. Anyway, it's, a, it's an unhealthy fry vine. Fry will usually yield a little bit better than that. Our growers are normally for mid-season bronze still using fry. We'd like to have something different, but we just don't yet have a replacement for it. Late season bronze usually comes down to late fry or granny val. Uh, each of them has positives and minuses. They're both self-fertile. Granny val is a very productive vine, a very vigorous vine. You can see the amount of grapes in the Granny Val there. My biggest problem with Granny Val is that the flavor is only average at best. Late Fry, I feel like, has a little bit better flavor, uh, but it's a little harder to pick a clean berry in terms of it tearing. And not quite as late. Yeah. I'd like to see a. Yeah, I would one agree that too. Granny Val be uh, come out with release that's way better than it. You know, more similar to Fry and Summit that's uh, that late. You know, my experience with even the standard varieties when they're ripening in September don't have as sweet of a flavor as the earlier ones. As the earlier ones. And so I'm not sure how much is Granny Val's cultivar and how much it is that it's ripening later when we're not getting as good a flavor. Um, but that is a big thing we're trying to do in the breeding program is get more late varieties to give us better options to extend the season into September. And then behind you is your standard um, wine varieties. There's Noble Carlos. We have Welder Magnolia down there. Generally wine varieties it always comes down to Noble and Carlos unless you're doing something special. Uh, there's nothing right now that Blackwise to compete with Noble in terms of vigor, production, and um, cold hardiness. Uh, there is one we'll look at over there that University of Arkansas is going to release as a juice grape that uh, you can see if you like it better. But most wineries are using Noble and then Carlos. Carlos to me is only average in quality, but it is pretty cold hardy. It's vigorous, it's productive. The trait you want in a juice grape is it's just generally 
tons per acre and then not having anything wrong with it. Uh, if we could do something to get it a little more disease resistance, that would be great. That's the one thing, but we do a little bit of looking at juice varieties, but not much. Uh, it's hard to get wineries to change varieties. It's hard to walk progeny rows and determine what's going to be a good wine variety. I can walk a row of seedlings and pull out the ones that would be good fresh market. That's much harder to look at a group of seedlings where they're all medium sized and productive and trying to figure out which one's going to be the next uh, big juice grape is a little bit tougher to do. So we generally focus on fresh market for our breeding work. All right, let's walk over to the, the black ones. All right, this is Supreme. This is pretty much what the commercial industry in Georgia is based on. It's big, it's got a crisp skin, it's fairly firm when you feel it. So the grocers like it because it feels firm, so it feels fresh to them. Uh, it stores better than pretty much any other cultivar out there in terms of cold storage and keeping that firmness in it. Uh, the other thing about Supreme, you notice, uh, very uneven in ripening. You'll have some in here fully ripe, some just turning ripe, some just at Verizon. In this cluster, you even have some that even haven't hit Verizon. That's pretty typical for Supreme. Uh, that means you can harvest Supreme. If you want to go over it early, you can get some early berries, then you get some mid-season berries, you get some late berries. Uh, for pick your home or home garden, that's usually kind of beneficial to have a wide range of harvest seasons. For the commercial guides that like to just pick them and go, uh, that's a little bit harder for them to make use of. Supreme is female, but it's one of the most productive females out there. Oftentimes even too productive. You can see this vine is struggling to keep up with the amount of fruit in it. That is the maximum amount of fruit you'd want to see on a vine. And you start to see it's pulling some of the stuff out of the leaves. These could use a little bit more feeding than they probably got. Uh, so that's the problem with Supreme. Uh, cold hardiness can be a Supreme. If you're in the Carolinas, you want to be careful about planting too much Supreme. It has shown a tendency to, to get a lot of kill in the winter some years. And a lot of that's probably due to having such heavy crops and it's weakening the vine that way, setting it up for winter injury. The next one down is Majesty. It was released at Supreme by Triumph. This was released by Florida A&M. I kind of like Majesty in terms of the flavor. Very similar looking to Supreme. Uh, Good as Supreme or better? Yield and is, can be as good as Supreme, oftentimes is much less than Supreme. The females are very inconsistent in terms of their yield. One year they'll do good, one area they'll do good, other areas they do not do so well. I'm not sure where you can get vines of majesty in terms of buying vines, but it's got kind of a good flavor to me. Yeah, it's hard to get Ison, the vines. Ison started carrying are they last carrying year? Now? Last year. Yeah. We bought some. About two. These are two you can't find. Rosa and Dixie Red. Yeah, they're older varieties and I just don't think they're out there much. They're just not what most people are looking for today. They're just not as good a quality ones. Yeah, that one, it tasted good, but the skin was a little tough. Yeah. Dixie Red's kind of tart. The one I ate was a pretty tart. Maybe I just got a tart one. You know, I haven't paid a lot of attention to Dixie Red. That one I ate was a little tart. Yep, even a good rifle. It looks like it's a little late or two, and it may not be quite there mm -hmm. yet. Oh. I just get the animals out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do have the chain link and pull, but it doesn't completely keep them out. The raccoons are just a little bit. This is Paul. This was released uh, by us to try and, um, we wanted something self fertile with similar size and quality to Supreme. I think it has potential. I do not think it'll completely replace Supreme. Uh, for one thing, it ripens later than Supreme. Usually you can see these are not quite there yet. Uh, size is pretty good. More consistent than Supreme, but the biggest pock are not as big as the biggest Supreme berries. 
Uh, it's more texture wise, more similar to a traditional muscadine. It's not quite as crisp and firm as Supreme. Uh, it's much less likely than Supreme to tear when you pick it. You get very good picking scars on them. Uh, one of the things we try to select for is long stems. So a lot of times the Supreme clutch will be real tight and that forces you to reach and pull on the, you grab the and squeeze the back of the berry and then yank it off. That's a, that's a recipe for splitting the stem in. The caulk, you can reach around the berry and twist and get a much cleaner. So you get, the growers get much better pack out. When it ripens, it's usually fairly consistent along the vine. You should be able to pick it all within one or two pickings. That's good if you're a commercial grower, it's maybe not so good if you're doing pick your home or home garden where you want a more drawn out harvest. Uh, the berries do not last on the vine as long as Supreme. Supreme, you can just, if you don't pick them, you can come back next week and pick them. Sometimes it's another week. Uh, the pock tend to start going if you don't get them picked. I usually tell growers no more than half your big black acreage would be pock compared to Supreme. Uh, I think the Supreme pock store okay, but Supreme store exceptionally in cold storage. So if you're going to hold on to berries, You'd want to sell your pock first and hold on to the Supreme to sell later. Some of the ones down here get a little more obscure. This is Ison. Uh, Ison is just a good all around vine, good vigor, decent quality, self fertile, um, sets a good crop, just nothing really wrong with it. To me, quality of it is good, not great. That's a little bit softer than I usually like in a muscadine. Uh, but otherwise, a pretty good home variety. Pollyanna, to me, is very, it's, it's similar to some of the other University of Florida releases. These tend to have a little more muscadine -y flavor. Pollyanna is a little later, so it's just now starting to rise. You know where it can be bought? I've been trying to buy it for 10, 15 years. Only if somebody in, um, Smaller in Florida is doing it. I, I couldn't tell you that I know of one that's offering it. You're right. It's got a good flavor. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's, it's not. Uh, on the it's one of the latest two or three no, of black. Uh, right from the black. Yeah, I think it would have potential, but like you so say, you just can't get them right anywhere. I don't mind Pollyanna. I don't mind Southern Jewel, but you just can't get them easily. Mm -hmm. I've got Delicious, which is... I've got Southern Jewel from, I think, Just Fruits and Exotic. It has some huge clusters on it. I think that's where I got it. <laughs> that's Sugar Gate. That's one of my favorites for um, quality, if you can find a berry. <laughs> right. That's why I got rid of it. That might be why it's always on. good quality, because right. it has so few. Uh, Lane, we released to have an early self fertile black. Uh, I have to say, I'm a little disappointed in the vigor of the vine on Lane long term. Uh, but if you want something that's early and black, there's really not a lot of choices out there. We're trying to find something to replace this to get a little more vigor in it. Uh, it holds on a vine well. Uh, the first year or two, you're going to have to watch it over cropping because the vine vigor is not great and it wants to set a big crop. Uh, once it gets mature, it's less bad about doing that. If I were planting lane, I would plant them probably no further apart than 15 feet, just because of that reduced vigor. I would just get more vines in there. Uh, and then I've heard growers say that if you spray extra, I think it was iron mag they were using, some sort of magnesium that gets that helps. Yeah, you basically you find have, early fry to be almost identical in that area as lane. What do you mean by it? Then? Early fry, uh, it being a heavy producer and it's not uh, one of the most vigorous vines, and it can be like that lane vine and produce more than uh Yeah, although early fry being female, sometimes it's not as bad to me. That's to me, lane. it's a heavy producer, and it's not. It's one of my least, <clears throat> least vigorous vines. We planted three in 2018. We just took them up this year. Just to do Early fry? Yeah. Well, we planted another one in another spot just to see. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good, I bet. Yeah. Probably hope. Mine does good. Early fry. It's that 
That's one of the low, lower vector ones mm -hmm. that you can stay in line. Delicious. Right? Some of our growers have used for clamshell sales. Uh, what is it? Delicious. That one's delicious. I, I got it. Yeah. It's good flavor. Um, just average texture and quality and size. The vine's usually fairly good, although this one doesn't look so great. It wants to do this where it does set too many berries. But I think if we were to thin the spurs out, it'd be a little better. But usually the flavor, even if the vine looks like it's overset, a lot of times the flavor can still be pretty good. Nesbitt is one that was recommended a long time for home use. Uh, it can be okay. It's a fry by coward. Uh, the, the nurseries don't like it. It's hard to root the vines, and so they're not wanting to sell it. It was used fairly high, and it was, came out of Carolina. It was used in North Carolina as a fresh market grape. I liked it as a home grape because it tended to do this, where you, you have some ripe and then some coming, and so you had a very nice, long harvest season. So as an all-purpose grape, it was pretty good. Southwood, in my mind, is one of the best two for um, mus true muscadine flavor. It's not got any of the other quality traits you'd want for a fresh market muscadine, but the aroma and flavor of Southwood is outstanding to me. I agree. This one was released by uh, the Mississippi Breeding Program, Overcash in Mississippi, fairly far back. Their, um, their other release that I like is Magoon, which is a little bit smaller than this even, but has even more aroma and flavor in it. Uh, I don't think you can really get Magoon. It's hard to get now. But they tended in their breeding program, they used some different germplasm than Florida and North Carolina used, and that's why it, it's got the little different flavor. We've made some crosses with it, trying to get that flavor into a bigger muscadine. If you could get something big like Supreme and have Just like this that. kind of Roman flavor would be great. What is that one? Eudora. Eudora. Eudora I believe has South one as a parent. This is bigger than South one. I don't, it's just another one of those like Nesbitt that's kind of a medium sized black grape with a traditional muscadine. What's not, is it, you got a name yet? Is Eudora. It, oh, Eudora, yeah. Mark, right, got it. It's got good flavor, it's just a little softer than most growers are looking for. This is Southern Home. Right now, Southern Home is the only thing you can buy with these type of leaves. Um, Arkansas is breeding with it a lot to get those leaves in. We've used it some too. I'm pretty sure in the next 10 to 15 years, there'll be a couple different cultivars that have that type of leaf pattern. You can get the berries up to full size and keep that leaf pattern with no problem. We have a graduate student that has found uh, the chromosome section from vinifera grape that brings in that leaf pattern. It's just a single chromosomal region that controls that trait. Yeah. Other than being attractive, it really doesn't do anything good or bad for the plant. Loomis, another one from Mississippi. That's a very late, kind of a reddish grape. It tends to have a very acidic flavor. And this is just Lake Charles. Somebody, some grower gave it to us. It's got to have commercial background, but we don't know what it is. This is Lake Charles. I assume that would be a great one to throw it on your We use it a little bit in breeding. This is the Lake Charles. There you go. Got a pretty strong flavor. Mm. How'd you come by? Somebody just gave it to you. Somebody just gave it to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't never want it because it don't make enough paid trimming bills. Right? Here one. Do the three. That's a mouthful in one. Mm hmm. Mm.
this right here is the best in our opinion muscadine of the day so to all of you have lasted this long on this video to see exactly what we've been doing in tifton georgia four and a half hours away from home we've been enjoying some great muscadines and having a great time just fellowshipping with a lot of different people and one other thing we've done is enjoy way too many muscadines so here's to you don't forget to like share and subscribe give us a thumbs up ring that bell like mike tyson did in the 1980s and i hope that each and every one of y'all have a wonderful day Mm, 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 mm. Man. Mm. This is so good. We added about nine vines this year. We, you know, we just had a couple last year, but we tried to expand things slowly, yeah. um, just for home home use and maybe. You know, fresh market locally, that kind of thing. I'm just trying to get like one of every variety, just collecting them. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got an older guy at our church oh, that he has a. He's got about 40 pounds. That's about real and, uh, robust yep. flavor. I mean, yeah, I'm you just can't beat it. Well, Muscadines just pop. They use a small, years, but man, the flavor is <laughs> unreal. <laughs> Can't match it. Pass them to your commercial store. No, yeah, we you always give me some when you make them bigger. Yeah.